biology. Let's go to question number five. And question number five, as you can look, we have a diagram there. So let's see, what is this diagram asking? So the question is asking, study the diagram of some organelle below. So it means that these indeed are organelles. So since we know that these are organelles, we can just try maybe first of all to assess the diagram to be able to think which organelles can be this. So for the diagram on the lower part, you can see that we have that organelle with very small uh, black dots. And the only organelle in plant or animal cell which has these small dots is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. That is the only organelle possessing the small dots on the exterior part. So it means that for that we can certainly say that that is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So apart from that we can see now organelle labeled A. So for the organelle labeled A, take note that it looks exactly same like the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, but that can't be the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So, how can you be able to differentiate between Golgi body and smooth endoplasmic reticulum by looking at the diagram? So, you should know that all endoplasmic reticulum, they originate from the nucleus. So, from the nucleus is where the rough endoplasmic reticulum originates and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum originates. So, if you have any diagram looking like smooth endoplasmic reticulum anywhere in the cytoplasm, automatic yeah like it is in the cytoplasm and not attached to the nucleus that automatically becomes the golgi body or the golgi apparatus so for this diagram we can see that we have this diagram labeled a and we have not been told that nucleus is anywhere around it so it is alone like that hapokwa a so this will then tell us that letter a most likely is golgi apparatus and then for the Golgi apparatus, you can see the small circles with the arrows, and then we have another thing up there. So question A is asking, identify the organelle labeled A. So based on the analysis of our diagram, we can say that uh, the diagram labeled A, that is the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body. So question B is asking, give three functions of the organelle named in A above. So what are the functions of the organelle labeled A, which is the Golgi apparatus? So the first one you can say that it assists in transportation of cell secretions because that's the function of Golgi apparatus. So transportation of cell secretion. So apart from that, you can say it also produces lysosome. Uh, for the yeah, it also produces lysosome, which are used to fight uh, harmful microorganisms in the cell. Apart from that, you can say that it also um, facilitates secretion of proteins and carbohydrates in the cell. So it also facilitates that um, secretion of the different proteins and carbohydrates in the cell. Then apart from that, the obvious function that we know about this apparatus, uh, this organelle, rather we can say that it facilitates transportation uh, of glycoprotein. So packaging and transportation of glycoprotein within the cell. But since we have been mentioning glycoproteins uh, and it has not been explained in the book, what are these glycoproteins that, uh, that we keep mentioning? So, what are glycoproteins? So, in short, these glycoproteins, they are proteins which contain carbohydrate in their polypeptide chain. That is the glycoprotein. So, they are carbohydrates which contain protein in their polypeptide chain. So, that is what uh, the glycoprotein is uh, always referred to. So, let's go to question number six. So, question number six is asking... A student was viewing a slide preparation of a chick cell and a high power uh, microscope lens. So then we are being told that the features of the cell were therefore seen to be blood. So after observing this chick cell, so he realized that the features of the cell that he was observing were blurry. So the last part of the question is asking, name the part of the microscope that the student would use to obtain a clear outline of the feature. So name the part of the microscope that the student uh, should use to obtain a very clear uh, sample or to obtain a very clear image of the, of the object or the chick cell he was using. So the only part of the microscope you can use to obtain a clear and a sharper outline of the image is the fine adjustment knob. And that was our question here. So if you use the fine adjustment knob, uh, you are going to get a very sharp image of the object that you are trying to observe in the microscope. So question letter B was asking, give the formula for calculating magnification in a microscope. 
So, what is the formula for this uh, calculating magnification? So remember, the microscope, the main lenses of the microscope are two. So we have the eyepiece lens and the objective lens. But if you have been asked this question, how many lenses does the microscope possess? So the microscope possesses three lenses. The first lens, we have the eyepiece lens. The second lens, the microscope pro, uh, has, we have the objective lens. And the third lens, the microscope has, we have the condenser. So the microscope possesses three lenses, whereby two of them are actively used for observation. So the first lens is the eyepiece lens used for observation. The next one is the objective lens, which is used for observation. So to calculate magnification of a microscope, so you take the magnification of the eyepiece, you multiply with the magnification of the objective lens. So the eyepiece lens times objective lens, you get magnification, and that's what gives us uh, the answer to this question. So the question was asking, give the formulas to calculate magnification in the microscope. So the formula is magnification is equals to the eyepiece lens magnification times the objective lens magnification. So question number seven is asking, guard cells are specialized cells. So stage two features which suit them for their function. So guard cells, they are specialized cells. So which two features suit the guard cells to function appropriately as they function? As you can look at this diagram, this is the diagram of the guard cell when the stoma, uh, when it's turgid, the stoma is going to open. When it's flaccid, the stoma is going to close shut. But what are these two characteristics or features which make the guard cells to function as the guard cells? So the first feature we can say, we can say that uh, they possess a very thicker wall to the inside and a thinner wall to the outside. So what's the function of these walls? So like why is it that the inner wall is thicker but the outer wall is thinner. So this is for the guard cell to be able to accommodate water, therefore be able to expand and open or close the stomata. So that's the function why it possesses a very thicker wall and a thinner wall to the outside. So the thinner wall to the outside, it allows the expansion and stretching of the guard cell towards the outside. While the, the inner wall, it allows for the opening of the stomata as the outer wall is stretching. So the other one you can say that the guard, cell, the guard cells also possess chloroplast which are used for photosynthesis. So since they have chloroplast so the guard cells can also be able to carry out the process of photosynthesis. So remember for photosynthesis we say that there are two stages which are the light stage and the dark stage and we went through it in detail. So as you can look at the guard cells again, you can see that if the guard cell is going to absorb water by osmosis, it is going to become turgid. If it becomes turgid, then the stoma is going to open. Remember, if it is one, it is stoma. If there are many, therefore it's going to be called the, it is going to be called the stomata. But if the guard cell is going to lose water to the surrounding epidermal cell, it's going to become uh, flaccid. And then since it's going to become flaccid, then the the stoma is going to close shut, as you can look at the diagram. So when it is turgid or swollen, it is going to expand and the stoma will open. But when it is flaccid, so it is going to close shut and the, the stoma is going to close. So let's go to number eight. So number eight is asking, a student observed that when sodium chloride was poured on the soil, having vegetation, the grass immediately dried up. So explain this observation in relation to osmosis. So if the student poured, when the student poured salty water on the grass, so he realized suddenly that the grass had, uh, the grass began to dry. So grass ilianza could dry up. So that's what now the question is asking. Explain this observation. Why did the grass dry? So we see that since the water that the student poured had sodium chloride or had dissolved salts, so as the student poured this dissolved salt on the soil, what happened is that since the roots of the grass were in contact with the soil, so the soil now became hypertonic as inside of the root now became hypotonic. In short, the soil became highly concentrated and the roots became lowly concentrated. So through this, you see that water moved out of the root and into the soil through the process of osmosis. But what is osmosis? So osmosis, remember we say that this is the process whereby water molecules will move from a region of low concentration area to a region of high concentration area. 
That is the first definition of osmosis. But what is the other definition of osmosis? So you can say that for osmosis, this is the movement of water molecules from a region of high water concentration inside the root to a region of low water concentration on the surrounding cells. So if you can use either of this definition to explain this point, you are going to get it right. So by this we see that most of the water moved from inside the root uh, where the concentration was low and to the outside to the soil where the concentration of solute was very high. So by this don't forget that in osmosis we also discuss the three types of solution. We say that we have hypertonic solution which is a highly concentrated solution. We say that we have hypotonic solution which is a lowly concentrated solution and we also say that we have isotonic solution. So for the isotonic solution, we say that these are two solutions which are separated by a semi-permeable membrane that have exact the same amount of concentration. So if two solutions have exact, uh, exact amount of concentration and they are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, so that solution automatically then becomes, those two solutions then automatically become isotonic solutions. So let's go to question number nine. So question number nine, <coughs> We have a diagram there. So the question is asking, the setup below was used to investigate a physiological process by form two learners. So then we are being told that P and Q represent solution of different concentrations. So as you can look at the diagram we have at the beginning of the experiment, and then after that, uh, we have after one hour, that is what happened. So you can see that the apparatus are at the beginning of the experiment is slim. But after one hour, you can see that the apparatus has grown in size. It has swollen or it has expanded. So for the liquid inside the boiling tube, we can see that it is liquid P. And the liquid inside the apparatus R, it is labeled Q. So the question is now asking, name two materials in the school laboratory that can be used in place of R. So which two materials can be used in place of R? So looking at the diagram, we can say that apparatus R is a semi-permeable membrane. So which material can be used in place of R, which is a semi-permeable membrane? So the first obvious one you can use in the laboratory is the visking tubing. I know most of us have come into contact with the visking tubing. It looks like a cello tape, and that is the most immediate one that you can use, the visking tubing. After visking tubing, we can also use a cellophane. So for the cellophane, I know most of you have come across cellophane, which are which are papers of different colors and they are mostly used in decoration. However, these cellophane are also semi-permeable membrane and in this case, they can also be used in this, uh, in this process. Apart from that, we can also use a dialysis tubing whereby this dialysis tubing can, it is, since it is also semi-permeable, it can be used in place of R because it's going to allow solution to move from this other side to this other side. So we can use either of those in the school laboratory to carry out this experiment. So the next question is asking question letter B. Which term is used to describe solution P in relation to solution Q? So which term is used to describe solution P in relation to solution Q? If you can look at the diagram, you can see that solution P, which is found in the boiling tube, is the one which moved from uh, the boiling tube and into solution Q. So the solution P really move, it can gear into solution Q. And now since this question we have been told that we are investigating two solutions. So if we are investigating two solutions, solution, solution, automatically this becomes osmosis. Since we are investigating between two different solutions. So automatically it becomes osmosis. So the question is asking, which term is used to describe solution P in relation to solution Q? So you can see that since solution P moved from the, um, from the boiling tube and into the apparatus, we can then say that solution P is hypotonic while solution Q is hypertonic. Because remember for the definition of osmosis, is the movement of water molecules from a region of high water concentration to a region of low water concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. Or you can say osmosis is the movement of a water molecule from a region of low concentrated area to a region of high concentrated area. And for this solution P, we see that it moved from uh, the boiling tube and into the apparatus R. So for the solution P, we can say that solution P is hypotonic while solution Q is hypertonic. 
So question letter C is asking, account for the observation made after one hour. So account for the observation made. If I've been asked in an exam to account for something. So for accounting, this accounting means you should, you should give your answer in detail. Tell me why that thing happened exactly the way it happened. That is accounting. Give me extreme details to tell me that from step one, it went to step two, then step three. And that's how you have the final, which is step four. So in accounting, you should give detailed answers step by step as to why uh, something happened the way it happened. So for this experiment, you can say that Q increased in volume and size since Q was hypertonic while P was hypotonic. Therefore, solution P, since it was hypotonic, moved from a region of low concentration from the, uh, from, from the boiling tube and into apparatus R. So that is it. You, you only need to explain that. Why did it move? So letter P moved into Q because letter P was slowly concentrated. So it moved to a region of high concentration inside the apparatus R and into Q. So let's go to question number 10. So question number 10 is asking, explain the role of oxygen in active transport. So what is the role of oxygen in active transport? So the role of oxygen in active transport, you can say, it is simply used to oxidize food in order to produce energy. That is the role of active transport. It is used to oxidize food. So since it has oxidized the food, therefore now this food is going to be used to produce energy for the process of active transport. So remember this we discussed in respiration uh, in the Form 2 video that we just covered. And in this respiration, remember we say that we had two types of respiration, which was aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. For the aerobic respiration, remember we say that oxygen must be present. And since oxygen is present in aerobic respiration, a lot of energy was being yielded because the food was completely oxidized by oxygen to produce 38, 36 to 38 ATP, which is a very high amount of oxygen. But for anaerobic respiration, we say that since oxygen is not used, there was very low production of oxygen, whereby the oxygen produced in anaerobic respiration was only 2 ATP. So, getting back to the question now, remember that the function of oxygen in aerobic respiration is oxidation of food in order to provide energy uh, for active transport. Because in Form 1, remember, in cell physiology, we discussed kuhusu three types of, uh, three types of physiological process. We say that we have diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So for diffusion and osmosis, we say those are passive because they don't use oxygen. But for active transport, remember we say that it is active because it must use oxygen and there also must be protein carriers. So whereby for active transport, we define this as the movement of molecules against concentration gradient. So if the concentration gradient for diffusion wants to move molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So this active transport may step in and force molecules under diffusion to move from a region of low concentration, forcing them to move to a region of high concentration. That, of course, is by using the protein carriers and energy to force these molecules to move against their concentration gradient. The same with osmosis. If the water molecules want to move from a region of... Uh, low area concentration to a region of high area concentration, active transport may step in and force the molecules of water to move from a region of high area concentration to a region of low area concentration against concentration gradient. So that's why active transport must always use energy. And for this energy to be produced, oxygen must be present in order to oxidize and break down the food to produce that energy. So let's go to the other part of the question. So the other part of the question, which was part B, was asking, name three processes that depend on active transport in animals. So name three processes that depend on active transport in animals. So remember, this question is specific. It is asking about animals and not about plants. So what are these processes? So the first process, we can say absorption of food in the alimentary canal. So for the food to be absorbed from the small intestine into the bloodstream, active transport must be used so yeah so we can see uh, that is one of them so the other one you can say absorption of some salts and sugars in the kidney 
of the of the mammal so reabsorption sorry reabsorption of some salts and sugars in the kidney so apart from that you can say excretion of waste products from the cells and the organelles which are found in the cells so this excretion of waste products from the cells and the organelles also it takes place by the process of active transport not to forget in the topic of reception response and coordination in form 4 what we studied remember we studied about the sodium ion pump in the nerve cells so for this sodium ion pump in the nerve cells they also require energy in order to function so the other answer we can say functioning of the sodium pump in the nerve cell in order to bring the action and the resting potential so remember this uh, we studied about action and resting potential so these two potentials they work simultaneously in order to bring uh, like in order to bring about a certain stimuli so for stimuli or an impulse to be transmitted between the nerve cell so action potential and the resting potential they coordinate rapidly in order to bring about the impulse but for a minute let's look at this action and resting potential by the way so the two potential remember we said we have action and resting potential and we always begin with the resting potential which is again after resting potential it is followed immediately by the action potential but what is the resting potential so for the resting potential if you can look at this diagram in this diagram you can see that in the resting potential there are many sodium ions outside while inside of the of the axon we can see that we have very many potassium and negative ions so if you see such a diagram uh, many potassium and negative ions inside the axon many potassium outside many sodium outside of the axon automatically this implies that this is a resting potential so during the resting potential what happens so during resting potential we see that the axon membrane becomes polarized if this axon membrane becomes polarized you can see that the sodium pump now begins to function what is the function of the sodium pump? The sodium pump actively pumps sodium outside of the axon. So from inside the Kizitoa injure. That is now the first function of the sodium pump. So in the resting potential, the sodium pump uh, constantly functions in order to remove sodium from the axon and to the exterior part. This is automatic, automatically brought by now the polarization of the membrane which allows the sodium ions to move through the axon so after that uh, we after the resting potential it is immediately followed by the action potential but what is the action potential so as you can look at this diagram of the action potential so for the action potential you are going to realize that now we have many potassium ions to the outside and uh, many sodium ions now to the inside of the axon so during action potential uh, like what happens we see that the sodium pump temporarily ceases to function if the sodium pump is going to temporarily cease to function sodium ions are going to force themselves inside the axon so as the sodium ions are being forced inside the axon potassium and negative ions are being forced to move outside of the axon so in this case if you see a diagram like this potassium and negative ions are found to the outside while now sodium ions are found in the inside of the axon this automatically implies that this is now a resting potential. So, the action and the resting potential now lead to a nervous impulse. So, after the resting potential, it's followed immediately by action potential. And if these two things happen like that simultaneously, so the cell body is going to detect that an impulse is either coming or an impulse is moving through the axon. So this impulse, remember now we say that this is now the one which now leads to a stimulus. Either you are feeling cold, you are feeling warm, you are feeling pleasure, or you are feeling pain. So don't forget about the action and the resting potentials that we have. So let's now go to question number 11. And for question number 11, you can see that we have teeth uh, uh, having cavities. And for the other diagram, you can see that the other diagram, the cavities already are in the pulp cavity. So the question is reading. Sophia had a toothache. On inspection, the mother realized that a hole had developed from above the teeth. So Roman one is asking, identify this disease. So which disease was this? So which disease leads to the decay of the enamel? So the only disease in teeth with, which leads to the decay of enamel 
is dental caries or tooth cavity. So for this answer, you can give either. So these are dental caries because you see that the cavities have broken through the enamel and they are going now uh, from inside to the inside of the teeth. So if these cavities are going to reach the nerve endings, so if they reach the nerve endings, therefore, that is where now you will start feeling that pain. But in the early stages of the dental caries, the teeth is going to be seen, uh, some dark spots are going to be seen on the teeth. So where do these dark spots come from? So if you don't brush your teeth regularly and you eat sugary foods, what's going to happen is that bacteria are going to develop on these sugary foodstuffs left on the teeth. As these bacteria develop on the teeth, they are going to release their waste products, they are going to release the chemicals. So these chemicals being released by the bacteria are slowly going to now begin to corrode the enamel. So the corrosion of enamel is now what brings that, those black spots on the teeth. It's due to the corrosion. So if you again don't brush your teeth regularly, this corrosion is going to be intense. If this corrosion becomes intense, therefore now it's going to break up the enamel and then head towards the pulp cavity. So if this corrosion reaches the nerve endings, that is now where someone is going to say that they are feeling pain in the teeth. So, yeah. So Roman 2 is asking, stage 2 is the disease would have been avoided. So how can, how could Sophia have avoided this disease? Is if ilifika. So for that, um, these are teeth health. So how can you maintain your teeth to be healthy? So the first one you can say regular brushing of the teeth. So that is the most obvious one regular brushing of the teeth. Apart from regular brushing of the teeth, you can see that uh, avoid sugary foods. So always avoid too much sugary foods. Every time you're taking sugary foods, you're drinking soda, taking sweets, eating, eating uh, biscuits. So avoid too much sugary foods. And then after that, chew hard foods. So nilu kipata miwa. Kula yo miwa kabisa. Eat that sugar cane. Because if you eat that sugar cane, you are biting on that hard part of the sugar cane. And therefore, it's going to remove this waste and uh, the waste products found in the teeth so eat very hard foods apart from that use the teeth for the right purpose so don't use your teeth to open soda cans don't use your teeth to bite what you're not supposed to bite so after that you can also say eat food which is rich in calcium and vitamin d because calcium and vitamin d they help for the development of strong bones in the teeth and for the teeth the teeth is just a bone a protruded bone uh, found inside the mouth. So take a lot of calcium and vitamin D. Apart from that, a uh, regular checkup of teeth in the de uh, by the dentist to ascertain that your teeth is healthy or your teeth need some examination. So let's now go to question number 12. He's asking, say the importance of each of the following features of the mammalian ilium. So the importance of these features. So remember, Ilium is part of the small intestine. So the small intestine is divided into two parts according to still the knowledge of high school. So the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum, which, is, which emerges immediately from the stomach. So from the stomach, immediately from the pyloric sphincter, that part is now the duodenum. So the last part of the small intestine, which is now attached to the large intestine or the colon, that part is now referred to as the ilium. So remember, the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. The second part of the small intestine is the ilium. So this question is asking, what is the importance of each of the following features of the mammalian ilium? So why should the mammalian ilium be highly coiled? So the first reason, it is highly coiled in order to fit in the abdominal cavity. So that's the obvious reason. It is highly coiled in order to fit in the abdominal cavity. The other one is that it is highly coiled in order to slow down the movement of food to allow maximum absorption of the digested food, or rather to allow maximum absorption and the digestion of that food. So apart from being able to fit in the abdominal cavity, it is to slow down the movement of food to allow for maximum absorption and digestion of that food. So the other one, why is it long? So the small intestine is long in order to increase the surface area for maximum absorption of that food. So that is what you can say. So it is long in order to increase the surface area for maximum absorption of the food. So question number 13 is asking, the shirt of a student was stained with DCPIP, whereby for DCPIP in full it is dichlorophenol, endophenol, acetic acid. 
So the shirt of a student was stained with DCPAP, which is dark blue in color. So the shirt of a student was stained with DCPAP. So a friend advised him to wash the stain with lemon juice. Explain. So why should the student advise the other student to wash the DCPAP with lemon juice? So remember the color of DCPAP, it's dark, dark blue uh, to navy bluish. So that's the color, dark blue, navy blue, hapo. So this student advised him to wash it with um, lemon juice. So the only place in high school that we are in contact with the DCPAP, it is only in the topic of nutrition in plants and animals and the subtopic of food test, whereby we are testing for vitamin C. That is the only place in the whole biology from 1 to form 4 we get into contact with DCPAP. So remember, the function of DCPAP in food test is to test for the presence of vitamin C. So if vitamin C is present in the food sample, DCPAP is going to decolorize from navy blue to colorless. So getting back to our question, the question is asking, a friend advised him to wash uh, the stain with lemon juice. Explain. So for the lemon juice, you see that lemon juice is vitamin C. It is an ascorbic acid. So, if we take this lemon juice and wash it with the stain, so the DCPAP found in the shirt of the student is going to decolorize immediately from the deep blue color to a colorless, uh, a colorless solution. So for this colorless solution, if this colorless solution is going to emerge, you're going to say that the stain is going to be removed. And that is the answer. So for this answer, we can say that lemon juice contains ascorbic acid. So since it contains ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, so this vitamin C is going to decolorize the DCPAP immediately from dark blue to a colorless solution, and that is now our answer. So the ascorbic acid, remember, is going to decolorize the DCPAP. So after decolorizing the DCPAP, therefore the shirt is going to remain to be, uh, to be clean as it's supposed to be. So question 14, we have this organelle that you can see, and the question is asking, Below is a diagram of an organelle. Even before we go to the questions, let's just try to analyze the organelle. So for this organelle, we can see that this is a chloroplast organelle. Why did you say it's a chloroplast? Because we have those stacked parts which look like coins on top of each other. And then from one coin to the next, you can see that we have a line which joins this set of coins to this set of coins. So if you see such a diagram resembling coins stacked up together, automatically that is a chloroplast. So for this diagram, this is a chloroplast. So let's now go to question letter A and see what the question is asking. State the function of, our, of the organelle drawn above. So since we know that this is a chloroplast, what's the function of the chloroplast? So for the function of this organelle is to facilitate the process of photosynthesis. That is the function of this organelle, to facilitate the process of photosynthesis. So for photosynthesis, remember we say that we have two stages of photosynthesis, whereby we have the light stage of photosynthesis and the dark stage of photosynthesis. So for the light stage of photosynthesis, remember we say that the main process in light stage, we say that it is photolysis. For the dark stage, the main process in dark stage, remember we say that it is carbon-4 oxide fixation. But for the light stage, let's look at the main process in light stage, which is photolysis. So for this photolysis, uh, this is the breaking of water molecules by sunlight to hydrogen atoms and oxygen molecule. Never say hydrogen gas, it is hydrogen atoms and oxygen molecules. So, for us to explain now this photolysis, we should talk about everything that is taking place in the photolysis, then we'll have explained the process in light stage. So the function of water molecule here is to be broken down by sunlight to hydrogen atoms and oxygen gas. We are done with water. Let's go to sunlight, which is the next one. So the function of sunlight here is to break down the water molecules from hydrogen atoms and oxygen gas. That is the first one. The second function of sunlight, you can say that the sunlight also provides energy for the plant in form of ATP. So for the sunlight, you can mention those two and you are good to go. So apart from that, we can talk about the next one, which is now hydrogen. Hydrogen, you can only say, hydrogen is then preserved for the dark stage. That is it for hydrogen. It is preserved for the dark stage, while oxygen, excess oxygen is released into the atmosphere, while some oxygen is being preserved by the plant for the process of respiration. Remember in the first set of information I said, excess oxygen. 
you should never say oxygen is released into the atmosphere. That will earn you a very healthy wrong. So you should never say that oxygen is released. You must only and only say excess oxygen is released into the atmosphere. While some oxygen is preserved by the plant for the process of respiration. And by that we are done with the main process in the light stage. Now for the next one, let's look at the dark stage. So the main process is carbon dioxide fixation. And for us to explain the process of the dark stage, we also need to explain this equation of the dark stage. So we can begin by saying hydrogen from the light stage reacts with carbon dioxide, which is a respiratory gas, in order to form the simple sugar, water molecules and energy. So that is the first step of our explanation. So the next bit, we can say that the carbon dioxide from respiration is being recycled to react with hydrogen gas in order to form now the simple sugar, water and energy. So apart from that, the next is the simple sugar. You can say that the simple sugar in this case, it is used by the plant to, produce, to provide the plant with energy as well. Excess of this simple sugar is stored by the plant in form of starch. What's the function of water molecules? So, excess water molecule, again, you must mention excess. Excess water molecule is released by the plant in form of dew, while some water mole molecules are preserved by the plant and recycled back into the light stage in order to facilitate the process of photolysis. So, excess water will be released in form of dew, while some water will be recycled by the plant for the light stage in the process of photolysis. So this energy which is being produced, the energy in ATP, the energy being produced, it is used by the plant for metabolic processes as well. It is used by the plant again to begin the process of photolysis in the next light stage. And then you are done with photosynthesis. That is the only thing you need to explain in photosynthesis and you earn your 20 or your 15 marks. So below is a diagram of an organelle. So this organelle, remember we say that the organelle is a chloroplast. So the last question, uh, the next question is asking, using letter G, label the part where um, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. So in the part label G, that is your oxygen is produced as a byproduct. So question next, name the part of the organelle where carbon dioxide is utilized. So in this diagram, where is carbon dioxide utilized for the process of photosynthesis? So it is utilized in that part, which is the stroma that you can see. So it is utilized in the stroma. So question number 15 is asking, consider the setups below where B and D are results of the experiment A and C respectively, which had been placed in the sunshine for three hours. You can see the diagram. So for the diagram, we see that we have, so consider the setup shown below where B and D are results of the experiment A and C respectively, which had been placed in the sunshine for three hours. So even before we dwell in the question, looking at the diagram, we can say that this diagram is testing on something gaseous exchange. And it is also testing on a principle on photosynthesis. So the first question, explain why the mouse died in B. Because you can see we have A and B, so explain why the mouse died in B. So between A and B, you can see that we have sunlight, we have a mouse, and we have a burning candle. Then after the experiment, you can see that the mouse is dead and the candle is off. So the reason why this mouse died in B, you can say that all the oxygen, <coughs> sorry, all the oxygen in the combustion tube were used by the candle to facilitate the process of, to facilitate the process of combustion. So during this combustion, you can see that the candle produces, produced carbon two oxide. So as the candle produced carbon two oxide, the mouse was able to breathe this carbon two oxide. After the mouse breathing carbon two oxide, this carbon two oxide uh, reacted with hemoglobin or combined with hemoglobin in the mouse whereby it formed carboxyhemoglobin. For carboxyhemoglobin, you see that this is a respiratory poison and that explained why in apparatus B, the mouse was dead and the candle was off. It's because all the oxygen had been used up by the candle for combustion and by the mouse for, for respiration. So there was competition of this oxygen. Then after oxygen was depleted, the candle began producing carbon two oxide. The mouse breathed in this carbon two oxide. It uh, bounded with hemoglobin for being, forming carboxyhemoglobin, which, are, which is a respiratory poison, which again led to the death of this mouse in apparatus B. And that's the reason why the mouse 
died in apparatus B. So the next question we are being asked, explain why the mouse was alive in apparatus D. So if you can look at this apparatus, you can see that for apparatus uh, C and D, so for apparatus C and D, you can be able to see that we have sunshine, we have a plant growing, we have a mouse which is there alive, and then we have a candle which is burning. And then in the apparatus D, it's exactly the same. So this principle is testing on photosynthesis. photosynthesis. During the light stage, the plants are going to take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. So that is light stage. During the day, plants are giving out oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. So since the candle was burning and there was mouse there, the plant was actively taking this carbon dioxide gas and then releasing oxygen. And that's why it explains that in apparatus D, all these things are still alive because the plant is actively consuming the carbon dioxide and giving the mouse oxygen and also the candle oxygen to continue with the process of combustion. So let's go to question number 16 is asking, identify the surfaces of gases exchange in the following organisms. So identify the surfaces of gases exchange in the following organisms. So the first organism we are being told is the paramecium. As you can look, this is the paramecium. So any single celled organism uses the cell membrane to facilitate the process of gases exchange. So since paramecium is a single celled organism, therefore this organism also is still going to use the cell membrane for the process of gaseous exchange. For this paramecium, remember we encountered this in the topic of classification 2 that was in form 3. It is a protozoa. Since it's a protozoa, it belongs to kingdom protoctista. So for the organisms in kingdom protoctista, remember we said that we have the amoeba, we have the paramecium, we said we have the euglena, we have the spirogyra, the plasmodium, etc., etc. So all these unicellular organisms, their respiratory surface is the cell membrane. So apart from that, Roman II is asking about the roots. So what is the respiratory surface of the roots? Is the epidermis. That is the epidermis because this respiratory surface, it only means where exchange of gases take place. So gases from this side can be able to pass to, to this other side by using what? So it is only the cell membrane. So they pass through the cell membrane from inside the root to the outer part of the soil. So for the roots, we have the cell membrane. And then finally, we have the frog. So for the frog, there are multiple. So the frog can either use the mouth, which is called the buccal cavity. It can either use the skin or it can use the alveoli found in the lungs. Mind you, you should never say that the gases exchange surface is lungs. If you say gases exchange surface is the lungs, you're going to get it wrong. But for you to get it right, you should say it is the alveoli which is found in the lungs because it is only in the alveoli where this exchange takes place. It doesn't take place in the lung body. It takes place inside the lungs in these parts which are called the alveoli. So that is for the frogs, which is now the alveoli. So let's go to question number 17. Question number 17 is asking, stage two adaptations of the red blood cell for transportation of carbon for oxide. So the adaptations of the red blood cell in transportation of CO2. Remember the question is specific. The question wants you to give answers based on transportation of carbon for oxide, not oxygen. So just base your answers on the side of carbon for oxide and not oxygen. So the first set of answers, you can say that the red blood cell is biconcave in shape. So since it, it's, since it is biconcave in shape, it has increased the surface area over which carbon dioxide can be able to diffuse into its body or um, to increase the surface area over which carbon dioxide can be able to diffuse from the cells and the tissues of the body and into the red blood cell. So the other one, you can say that it possesses uh, carbonic and hydrase enzyme which facilitates the conversion of carbon dioxide to carbonic acid, which is transported by the plasma. So that's the function of the carbonic anhydrase. So remember, hemoglobin is only used to transport, it's only used to, bound, to bind to oxygen for the transportation. So for oxygen, it's hemoglobin. While for carbon dioxide, the red blood cell uses carbonic anhydrase, whereby this carbonic anhydrase facilitates the conversion of carbon dioxide to to a carbonic acid, whereby this, this carbonic acid now is able to be transported to the plasma and to the lungs for the process of exchange from carbon dioxide to oxygen. Apart from that, you can say that 
it has a very thin membrane in order to shorten the distance over which the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the cells and the tissues and into the red blood cell. So apart from that, you can say that they are very small and tiny so that they can be able to pass so that they can be able to pass easily through the different cells and the tissues in order to pick up the carbon four oxide from the cells and the tissues of the body. So question 18 is asking, give a reason why halophytes have pneumatophores. So give a reason why halophytes have pneumatophores. So these halophytes, remember we studied them in the topic of ecology in Form 3. Uh, we studied the halophytes when you are looking at the different habitats of the different plants that we have. So for the different habitats, remember we said that we have the xerophytes, whereby these are plants which live in arid or desert areas. After that, we say that we have the mesophytes, which live in moderate environmental conditions or the moderate climate. There is some rain, there is some sunshine, so moderate environmental conditions. Apart from that, we say that we have hydrophytes, whereby these are organisms which lived in waterlogged areas or moist areas. And then apart from that, we now say that we have halophytes. So for the halophytes, we see that these are organisms which live in salt-prone areas or areas which bear a lot of salt, in the environment. Now the question is asking, give a reason why halophytes have pneumatophores. So why should halophytes have pneumatophores? So first of all, what are pneumatophores? So pneumatophores, these are breathing roots. So since they are breathing roots, you can see that most roots are found buried deep inside the soil. But for the pneumatophores, these are roots which have emerged out of the soil. So they are the roots which are not found inside the soil but are found on the surface of the soil, so suspended in the air. So that's why the question is asking, give a reason why the halophytes have pneumatophores. So you can see that since most halophytes are found in waterlogged areas, uh, so for this waterlogged, the, uh, this moisture or this water which is found in these areas has a lot of salt concentration. So the salt concentration in this water is very high. So since the salt concentration in this water is very high, this will mean that the amount of oxygen in this soil or this water is going to be limited. Therefore, for the roots, it will be very difficult for the roots to be able to obtain oxygen while inside the soil. Therefore, for the halophytes, they have now the pneumatophores, which are the roots which are suspended in the air, whereby for these roots, they, they basically use the oxygen around the atmosphere for the process of gaseous exchange. So that is the reason. So the answer you can give you, you can say that since the soil and the water in these areas has a very high concentration of salts, so it will mean that there is a very low amount of oxygen in the soil and in the water areas uh, whereby these plants are growing. So since there is a very high concentration of salt in these areas and low concentration of oxygen, therefore the halophytes have developed pneumatophores which are used to acquire now oxygen and release carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the answer to this lies now in the high concentration of the surrounding which reduces the amount of oxygen available. So for the next question, question number 19 is asking, state three homeostatic roles of the liver. So state three homeostatic roles of the liver. This one we studied in form two in the topic of excretion and homeostasis, about uh, homeostasis and the liver excretion, etc. So we did them in the previous videos. You can go and check if ilicupita. So state three homeostatic roles of the liver. So remember homeostasis, this is the maintenance of a constant internal body environment. That is the reason, that's the definition of homeostasis. So that these roles of the liver. So the first one we see that uh, we have thermal regulation. What is thermoregulation? From the word thermos. Anything thermo, it means heat. So you see that liver regulates uh, body temperature. So whereby if one is feeling cold, metabolic processes in the liver are going to, to accelerate. So if the metabolic processes in the liver accelerate or now become many or become high, the liver is going to produce heat. As now the blood is flowing through the liver, the blood is going to be warmed. As the blood is passing through the whole body, the blood is going to make the body to feel warm. So, when this person is feeling cold, the metabolic processes, processes in the liver are going to reduce. 
If these metabolic processes in the liver are going to reduce, thereby it's going to mean that the blood passing through the liver will not be warmed. And this is going to reduce the body temperatures. So apart from that, you can see that the liver also regulates uh, the blood sugar level, whereby in the liver we see that sugar is stored in form of glycogen molecules. So when the sugar level is down, uh, the, the, it's called what? the pancreas is going to release the glucagon hormone. So the glucagon hormone is going to go to the liver and facilitate the breakdown of the glycogen molecule, which is a polysaccharide, to many monosaccharides, thereby increasing the sugar level in the blood. So apart from that, you can see that the liver also regulates the plasma protein apart, for, apart from hemoglobin regulation. Then apart from that, you can see that the liver also produces bile juice, whereby the main function of bile juice in digestion is emulsification. What is emulsification? is the breakdown of large fat droplets to small oil, dro oil droplets, which now can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So that is the other function of liver, fat regulation through the process of emulsification. Also, don't forget, the liver also facilitates uh, protein and amino acid regulation in the body as well. So apart from fat regulation, it also facilitates protein regulation and also amino acid regulation in the body. So let's now go to question number 20, and it's asking, state one economic importance of each of the following parts of the plant excretory products. So what is the importance of tannin? So for the tannin, we see that it is used in treating of leather in leather manufacturing companies. It is also used in the manufacture of dye, manufacture of different fabrics, manufacture of different colors, and also uh, in decorating pots. So it is also tannin which is used to decorate pots by, by facilitating the pots to, to have the different shapes. Okay, this tannin is used to engrave the pots giving them the different patterns and the different shapes that the pot or the person making the pots will want to do. So in printing different patterns in the pot, yeah, that's the word, in printing different patterns in the pot. So tannin can also be used there. So apart from that, the next one, which is letter B, is quinine. So what's the function of quinine? So quinine is used in the treatment of malaria. It is a very active medication for treating malaria. So for the people who take alcohol, if you look at the, some of the ingredients, you can realize that some of the ingredients, they have quinine. So if you're going to take alcohol and you see that one of the ingredients in that alcohol is quinine, it's best for you not to take that alcohol because the more you take that alcohol, the more you are abusing this malaria medication, which is quinine. So the day that you're going to need that quinine in order to help you now treat or remove or cure you from malaria, Itakuwa ngumu because the malaria virus maybe will have already uh, developed resistance against that quinine. So it is very critical. So again, if you take alcohol uh, having quinine, you should reduce the intake or avoid that uh, taking that alcohol altogether because it is going to lead uh, into more harm than good. So the function of quinine here is to treat malaria disorder. So let's go to question number 21. So question number 21 is asking, state three structural differences, not functional, but state three structural differences between members of class Insecta and class Arachnida. So what are the structural differences? So remember, all these are found uh, in classification. We studied these things in classification. Like, for example, we have the insecta, which bears the insects, and we have the class arachnida, which bears all the arachnids. So for the first instance, we can see, let's begin with class insecta. For the difference, we can say that the insects, the class insecta, they have three body parts, while the class arachnida, they have two body parts. So for the class insecta, remember, we have the head, we have the thorax, we have the abdomen, but for the arachnids, we only have the head and the cephalothorax only. So for the head and cephalothorax, because if you can look at this diagram of the tick, you can see only we have the head and the cephalothorax only. So the thorax and the abdomen are fused together. So since the thorax and the abdomen are fused together, that is what is now called the cephalothorax. So apart from that, the other difference in class insecta, we can see that the insects have three pairs of legs, while the arachnids, they have four pairs of legs. 
So that is the other difference. So for the insects, they have three pairs of legs, don't forget. And for the tick, as you can see, the ticks have four pairs of legs, or the arachnids, they have four pairs of legs. And then for the insects, we see that they have a pair of antennae, while the arachnids, they do not have any antennae. And also, apart from that, you can see that the insects do not have a chelicerae or the pedipulp, while the arachnids, they have a chelicera and the pedipulp. So as you can look at this diagram, those few divisions of the mouth, those now form the chelicerae and the pedipulp. So for the insects, they do not possess that because most of the insects are herbivores. Uh, some of the arachnids are carnivores, some of them are herbivores. So for them that, that are herbivores, uh, that are carnivores, so they must possess this, which are mainly used for hunting uh, of the prey. So question number 22 is asking, give two reasons why accumulation of lactic acid during vigorous exercise leads to an increase in heartbeat. So when one is exercising, why should the heartbeat accelerate? Why should the heartbeat increase? So you see that lactic acid is poisonous in the tissue. So the reason as to why the heartbeat increases is so as to accelerate the process by which this lactic acid is going to be removed from the muscles and the tissue in order to prevent poisoning and the destroying of the different tissues and the cells in contact with the lactic acid. So apart from that, the heartbeat also increases in order to supply oxygen to the tissues so that lactic acid which is being produced can be oxidized into energy. Apart from that, we can see that the heartbeat also increases uh, like in order to facilitate the faster removal of carbon dioxide from the cells and the tissues by the blood, among others. So for that, we can only say those. So question number 23 is asking, state two ways in which anaerobic respiration is applied in industries. So also this question is specific. It is asking kuhusu anaerobic respiration, how it is applied in industries. So for the first one, we can see that it is used in baking industry uh, in order to form the bread, in order to form the cakes, etc. So it is used in baking industry. Apart from that, you can also say that it is used in the formation of different dairy products. For example, we have the yogurt. Apart from that, formation of organic acids also Formation of different organic acids, like for example, the acetic acid, the methanoic acid, they also use anaerobic respiration, having the symbiotic bacteria. And apart from that, in alcohol manufacturing factories or in brewing industries, whereby these are able now to form the whiskey, the alcohol, the kinamzinga, etc. and etc. So, question number 24 is asking Name the structures in the human body that detect. Roman 1, external temperature changes. So what in the human body detect external temperature changes? So for this, they are found in the skin. So we have the thermoreceptor cells in the skin. And for this topic, we discussed this topic in excretion and homeostasis, which was then expounded by the form 4 topic, which was reception, response, and coordination. Whereby in this reception, response, and coordination, we say that we have three different types of neurons or nerves whereby we say that we have the sensory nerve, we have the motor nerve, and then we have the relay nerve. So the sensory nerves in the skin, which are now here called the thermoreceptor cells, are the ones responsible to detect the external temperature changes or temperature stimuli. So Roman II is asking internal temperature changes. So in this part of the brain, which is called the hypothalamus. So it's the hypothalamus which is now able to detect now the internal temperature changes and relay this information now to the thalamus and finally to the cerebrum in order to bring now the voluntary movement that that body should be able now to endure. So question number 25 is asking, distinguish between population and community as used in ecology. So differentiate because distinguishing is exactly the same as differentiating. So distinguish between population and community as used in ecology. So what is population? So in short, for this population, you see that it mainly consists of organisms of the same species which are found in a specific habitat in a given period of time. So that is population. The number of uh, the same species found in a similar habitat within a give, given period of time. So for example, in this classroom, so if I can try to count only the, the dogs found in this classroom, so I'll be finding out the population of dogs in this classroom. 
So for population, remember, we only deal with the same species, the number of same species in a given habitat in a given period of time. That is population. But what is community? So for the community, you see that it consists of all organisms of different species interacting in a similar habitat. So all organisms in a similar, in one habitat, which are interacting. Or rather, uh, we can say, for community, it comprises of all the organisms um, of different species in a particular habitat, yeah. So the organisms of different species in a particular habitat, now that forms the community. For the population, again, don't forget for population, remember it means that it is organisms of a single species in a habitat in a particular period of time. While for community, we deal with different species in a similar habitat in a particular period of time. So for these terms, uh, don't forget these terms in ecology. Maybe, for example, you can just go through some of them. So the first one, we have ecology. Remember, this is the study of interaction of living and unliving things in an environment. Uh, so in ecology, don't forget, don't confuse ecology with biology. Because in ecology, we study the interaction between the living things and the non-living things. That is ecology. While for biology, we only study living things. So don't, don't you confuse those definitions between ecology and biology. Biology is the study of living things. Ecology is the study of living and non-living things and their interaction in the environment. So don't forget that. So part B of the question was asking, state one way through which energy is lost between different tropic levels. So state one way in which energy is lost between different trophic levels. So if you can look at this triangle, this triangle symbolizes the trophic levels that we have. We have trophic level of producers, primary consumers, tertiary consumers, contentary consumers. So like this question is asking, why is it that in the bottom part of the pyramid, there is a lot of energy, but in the apex of the pyramid, there is very low energy. So that is what this question is asking. So give one way through which energy is lost from one trophic level to the next trophic level. So the one is, uh, like the first one you can say it is through respiration. So through respiration, energy is lost. Through excretion and homeostasis, energy is lost. And also through defecation, energy is able to, uh, to be lost. Because this organism is eating a lot of food. And then, like after some time, it's going to excrete some of that food which has not been used in the body. So that's some of the food which has not been used in the body which is being excreted. That is now energy which is being lost in the environment. So question number 26 is asking, which part of the ovule forms the following structures after fertilization? So which part of the ovule forms, uh, which part of the ovule forms the following structures after fertilization? So the first one is the zygote. So the zygote is formed by the egg cell. So as you can look at this diagram, so the egg cell is the one which is responsible to form the zygote. Apart from that, the other part of the question is asking tester. So which part is able to form the tester? So we have the integument. So the integuments are now the outer part of the ovule. So the outer part of the ovule are the ones responsible for forming now the tester. So this outer part of the ovule is referred to as the integument. So the egg cell, remember we've said that this is now the one which now forms the, the zygote of the cell, uh, not the cell of the ovule that is so that is it. So question number 27 is asking, the diagram below shows fruit specimen dispersed by a certain agent. Study the diagram and answer the question that follows. So as you can see that diagram, that is a diagram of the black jack. So part A of the question is asking, what type of fruit is dispersed by the diagram above? So what type of fruit is dispersed? No, what type of fruit is represented by the diagram above? So this fruit is a cypsella fruit. So for the cypsella fruit, remember we said that the cypsella is a dry single-sided fruit which emerges from two ovary. That is a cypsella. So for this cypsella, this is a blackjack fruit, but it is under the classification of cypsella. So remember in form three, these classifications of the fruits that we studied, um, it was in the topic of reproduction, where we studied the different classification of the fruits. 
whereby we had the cypsella. If you can be able to look at this diagram of the fruit classification, you can see that we have the dehiscent fruit and the indehiscent fruits. So part A of the question is asking, what type of fruit is represented by the diagram above? So what type of fruit is represented by the diagram above? So this is a cypsella fruit. So why is it a cypsella fruit? So it's, it is a cypsella fruit because it is emerging from a dry fruit. And then since it's a dry fruit, it is an indehiscent fruit. So for the indehiscent fruit, remember we said that we have nuts, we have caryopsis, and then we have cypsella. So like under the classification of fruits, remember we studied in reproduction, we say that the fruit is classified into two. So the first one, we have succulent fruits comprising of the berry and the droop. And then we have now the dry fruits, which comprise of the dehiscent and the indehiscent fruits. So this cypsella is an indehiscent fruit. And that's why for our answer here, we have said that what type of fruit is represented by the diagram above. So that fruit is a, it's a cypsella fruit. Why is it a cypsella? It's because it is a dry mm, single-sided fruit which emerges from two ovaries. So that's why it is a cypsella. It is a dried fruit. So part B of the question is asking, name each of the following parts A and B. So as you can look at part A, so that part A, that is the hook, and then the part B is the pericap. Why did we say it's the pericap? Because this is the outer covering of the fruit. It's called the pericap. So the outer wall of the fruit is the one which is referred to as the pericap. So let's now go to question number 28. So question number 28 is asking, state three factors that are strictly, that strictly hinder self-pollination. So state three factors that strictly hinder self-pollination. So the first one we can say uh, we have protandry. So what is protandry? So for the protandry we see that it is when the stamen is going to ripe faster than the pistil. So if the stamen is able to ripe faster than the pistil, it is going to become ripe and shed off the pollen grains. But if these pollen grains land on the pistil, the pistil is still young. It cannot be able to now form the ovules which are going to be fertilized by the pollen grains from the stamen. So that phenomenon is called protandry. So the other one we can say we have protogeny, whereby protogeny is the opposite of protandry. So for, for the protogeny, you can see now that now, this is now where the pistil matures faster than the stamen. If the pistil matures faster than the stamen, the pistil is going to produce the ovules, but the, stamen, the stamens are still young. So they cannot be able to produce the pollen grains, which are supposed to fertilize now the ovules, which are found in the pistil. So this is going to hinder self-pollination. So apart from that, we can say that we have self-sterility or incompatibility. So for this self-sterility or incompatibility, you can see that the pollen grains from a similar flower cannot be able to fertilize the ovules of that similar flower. But they can fertilize other flowers outside, but for this same flower, so the pollen grains of this flower cannot be able to fertilize the ovules of the similar flower. So that phenomenon is called self-sterility or incompatibility. Apart from that, we have heterostyly, whereby heterostyly, this is the different arrangement of the style and the stigma of the plant. So whereby maybe you can see that we have very long, uh, very long pistil, or maybe you can see that we have very long uh, stamen. So whereby, if the stamen are going to release the pollen grains either, there are chances whereby these pollen grains are not going to land on the stigma of the similar flower. So this condition is referred to as heterostyly. So apart from that, we can also talk about the dioecious, uh, the dioecious nature whereby for the dioecious nature, we see that these are plants which have separate male flowers and different and female flowers. So we have a plant, but it has male flowers on that side and female flowers on this side. So if male flowers are on that side and female flowers on this side, this is going to hinder self-pollination, but encourage cross-pollination. So for the monoecious plants, remember, uh, for the monoecious plants are the plants which have flowers having both male and female parts inside the flower. But the dioecious plants, these are the plants only having a staminate flower, which is a male flower, and a pistillate flower, which is a female flower. So don't forget that. So let's now go to question number 29. So question number 29 is asking what is meant by the term seed dormancy. 
So for seed dormancy, we see that this is the period in which the seed is unable to germinate, even though ideal conditions have been provided. That is seed dormancy. So it's not going to germinate because maybe it is waiting for some period of time when it is maybe mature or if the nutrients gathered are enough so that now on itself it will begin to grow. So remember that is seed dormancy. It's the period in which seed is unable to germinate even though favorable environmental conditions have been provided. So part B of the question was asking, state any two external causes of seed dormancy. So external, not internal, external causes of seed dormancy. So you can say the first one we have low temperature. The next one you can say uh, lack of appropriate wavelength or light in the atmosphere, low water and moisture content in the atmosphere, low oxygen content in the atmosphere, too high or too low pH in the atmosphere, etc, etc. So, among others, so these are just some of the factors which can be able to, to accelerate the process of seed dormancy. So, if the temperatures are low, most of the enzymes in this seed are going to become inactive. So since most of these enzymes are going to become inactive, therefore it will mean that this seed is not going to grow because if the enzymes are inactive, no cells are going to take uh, any metabolic processes. So the seed is going to remain dormant for a long period of time. But how can we be able to break this seed dormancy? So how can we break seed dormancy? So the first method you can use to break seed dormancy is we can dip these seeds into warm water, whereby this process is called warm water treatment. So apart from that, we can gently scratch the tester of the seed in order to make the tester to be light so that moisture can be able to enter into the seed and then facilitate the process of growth. Apart from that, we can, we can also undertake heat treatment. So for the heat treatment, this is gently roasting the seeds in order to make the tester to break off so that the seed can be able to take in water. And apart from that, we can also treat the seeds with concentrated sulfuric acid. So if you do this, the concentrated sulfuric acid is going to destroy the tester. If the tester is going to be gently destroyed, so the seed is now going to take in oxygen and moisture and then cease to be dormant. Biology.